So what I, uh, Stacey kind of asked me to talk about really was as a, as a really setting the scene for our panel discussion in a moment where we're going to be really talking about the impact of the pandemic on organizations and the implications of that for organizational psychology and organizational psychologists. I really want to focus on the question of what the COVID pandemic has taught us about leadership. And there's two kind of uh, texts that I'm going to draw on in particular. One is our, our, our book with Steve Reicher and Michael Plato, the second edition of which was published last year, The New Psychology of Leadership. But also this book that I authored with um, uh, Yolanda Yetta and Steve Reicher and Tegan Cruz, but also includes contributions from a range of people, including Nick, Nick Steffens and um, Matthew Hornsey in the business school, really looking at the implications of what we know about psychology for uh, the pandemic. That was written, we put that together really quickly in the first two or three months of the pandemic, I think it's actually weathered pretty well. I think, again, it, I should say too, it's free to download on Kindle. So if you want to kind of dip into it and get a sense of what that says, I think actually most of the stuff that we say that has come to pass has been borne out by events. Um, but um, also too, is that we, we, in, the, over, in the course of the panel, we put together two major review articles, one with a range of collaborations, which was the, on the implications of social science for the management of the pandemic, and the other was around uh, leadership in the pandemic, again, which uh, Nick and Sarah uh, Bentley are authors on. So if you want to read up more or get the backstory on the things I'm going to talk about today, it's covered in those uh, books in rather more fulsome and, uh, uh, you know, fluent manner than I'm going to talk today. I think from the start of the pandemic, a, a, a kind of, I think, a, a point of focus was the idea that this was a, a, a thing which was going to affect us at a collective level, not just at an individual level. And in many ways, I would argue that psychologically speaking, as it's progressed, it's clear that the big stories around the pandemic, the things that we've been talking about and focusing on, are things that have affected us as group members. They've affected group life, our capacity to connect with others in meaningful ways and to live out our social identity, that sense of us. The things that, again, we in an internalized sense of the group so that the self isn't just me and I, it's we and us. And that we know from a really large body of literature is a basis for a sense of solidarity. And if, if social identity gets eroded, then you have a lack of uh, solidarity. Um, similarly, it's a basis for a sense of trust or a lack of it, compliance, going along with instructions, following instructions and followership more generally. That sense of connectedness and common purpose and, and striving towards difficult uh, shared goals, or again, a lack of it. Um, and more particularly, and the thing that I'm going to focus on today, leadership, again, is something that derives from social identity. But at the same time, too, there's a two-way relationship between these things. So solidarity helps to build social identity, trust as we build, and then, if you like, that common resource, this psychological resource of social identity gets kind of restocked. Uh, and early on in the um, pandemic, Andrew Cuomo, the mayor of New York, who's subsequently fallen from grace, um, said, you know, it's not about me, it's about we. Get your head around the we concept. And again, I think as a framework for understanding where you're going to get the best results in the pandemic and where the best things have happened, it's where people have been able to do that. And where things have tended to fall apart, it's where they haven't, if you uh, like. But I want to focus again in the few minutes I have here on the topic of leadership. And I guess for us, leadership researchers, of whom there's many in the School of Psychology, notably uh, Nick, um, I think the pandemic has exposed limitations in the way that people traditionally think about leadership. 
as you all know, because I, I know a lot of you have done organizational psychology, you've done, done my course, so you've, a lot of this material is kind of familiar to you, that the traditional, the old psychology of leadership was very much focused on the characteristics of individual leaders and suggested that leadership was a thing that's apparent to everybody and it's this abstract, rarefied construct that some people have and some people haven't got. What the pandemic, I think, has shown is that, is that leadership is grounded in the exigencies, the, the toings and throwings, the ups and downs of group life. Traditionally, the, the psychology of leadership suggests that leadership is fixed and static, but what we see is that it's dynamic. So throughout the pandemic, different leaders have had you know, moments in the sun and moments in the ditch, as it were, and people's popularity, pretty much of all leaders, has ebbed and flowed as a function of the coming and goings, the ups and downs, if you like, of group life. And those two things, group life and leadership, have very much tracked each other through the pandemic. But most fundamentally, the traditional psychology of leadership focuses on the I of the leader, the personal identity of the leader. But actually what we've seen over the course of the pandemic is that leadership is very much about we-ness. It's about marshalling collectives, building uh, collectives, embedding them, allowing people to do things together to move the group forward and deal with the range of challenges that it uh, presents. And again, I think probably the, uh, if you like, the trajectory of, of Donald Trump over the course of the pandemic bears that out. He went into the pandemic very much with the, you know, I'm bigger than this thing kind of mentality. And, and, and I think it was not only problematic for his leadership, it was hugely uh, problematic for the United States. I think the same is true of uh, a range of leaders like Boris Johnson as well, who were clung to a kind of, I think, a, a mistaken kind of Churchillian vision of what leadership is meant to be about. It's about the great I. Well, no, if you can't make that relatable to people as members of groups and take the group forward, you're going to have a problem. So this quote from Adair that you've all heard me say lots of times before, the least important word in the leader's vocabulary is I, and the most important word is we. Again, I think something that's been borne out in the last couple of years. If you say as an alternative to that, what has the pandemic shown? I think it's shown that social identity is absolutely critical for leadership. So effective leaders embody a social identity that they share with other group members and they exert influence on that basis. In that context, the most important job of leadership is social identity management that centers on a leader's ability to create, represent, promote, and embed a shared sense of us. So that has been the critical resource, the community sense of connection to, if you like, and from which we've got resilience and strength to address the range of challenges that we face. And without social identity, without that usness, leadership and just about everything else falls apart, as again we've seen in uh, the US. I think from a very sort of straightforward theoretical perspective then, responses to COVID underline the importance of four key elements of social identity management that we talk about in the new psychology of leadership and that are bound up in, in the, the, the tool that Nick developed, the identity leadership inventory, which kind of looks at leadership at large. The idea that leaders need to be identity prototypes who are one of us. Again, the, a leader that we, is relatable as someone who's on our side and on our team in this context. A leader who's kind of doing it for us, advancing our collective um, interests and who we can rally behind. Similarly, leaders are also creating that sense of us, making everybody believe that we're in this together. And to the extent that that's not believable, that's kind of problematic. And then embedding that in practice so that you have strategies, policies, policies activities, if you like, that make that kind of real. And I think, you know, you see that in Australia, I guess, particularly in things like the lockdowns and like the control of borders and so on, which are very much strengthened around group memberships. And they're about protecting us, our state, okay? So there's a big issue here about who is this us? Is it Queensland or is it Australia or whatever? And I think that's been a, an ongoing theme that we can kind of return to uh, later. But that's the kind of abstract theory. I guess a question that we have turned our heads to is, well, can we 
translate that into practical advice for policymakers, not just in, in the sort of political domain, but also in the organizational domain. And as I said, that was for that reason that we wrote these two big review articles, um, uh, which I think provide a framework or a reframing of these ideas in ways that, if you like, point to very specific things that leaders kind of need to do to get the outcomes that they need to mobilize group members to do the things that are necessary to protect and advance the interests of the group. So we argue, as always, that leadership is always bound up with processes of followership, centering on shared social identity. So on the one hand, leaders, effective leaders, engage in identity leadership where they reflect on the nature of shared identity, they represent us and our goals, they realize shared identity in plans and policy, they reinforce those through ongoing action, and they prepare the group, they ready the group for, if you like, the next kind of onslaught. And by the same token, on the receiving end, if you like, of leadership, the followership, the engaged followership, that is again the other side of the, if you like, the yin and yang of this process. What you see is that engaged followership, based on a sense of shared identity, where followers identify with leaders, yeah, then they embrace that in-group identity. They understand the actions that are necessary for the advancement of in-group goals, protecting us. So they do the things that are necessary. They socially distance. They wear masks. They, um, you know, they don't turn up to work. They don't, you know, they self-isolate and all the rest of it. Those things, the biggest predictor of those behaviours, and this is shown in surveys around the world that Nick and I and others have been involved in, is social identification. If you don't identify with the leadership and the country or the unit of analysis, you don't comply. Sort of pretty much end of story. And then you work towards leaders by doing what is necessary to, um, if you like, to, 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 to fill in the blanks here, to ensure that you get the right results. And again, and I've been, I've, I'm sure you've heard me and my colleagues talk on the radio a lot of times, but again, there's, there's lots of negative news stories in the context of COVID. There's one really big positive story, which is actually the extent to which people have willingly complied and done what is necessary to advance the group, to look after each other. That's what's driven most people's behavior. And that's, that's the big story. It's very boring because it's there every day and it doesn't sell newspapers. But the reality is levels of compliance are, are through the roof in the scheme of things. And the, the, the lunatics who aren't, if you like, you know, who don't want to vaccinate or wanna, don't want to social distance and think it's all a, 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 a scam and it's part of some 5G conspiracy thing, you know, they, they just don't identify. And, and I don't actually, I mean, the, the problem there isn't those beliefs. It's actually the fact that they live in a society which it's hard for them to identify with. So there's, even, there's issues there. I don't want to pathologize that. I just want to say the big predictor there is lack of identification. And that was a problem, if you like, prior to the pandemic. So translating those things into kind of five lessons, the first lesson, this reflect point, is that leaders need to reflect on the nature of shared identity. They secure followership by building and drawing on a sense of shared social identity. So again, you think of people like Bonnie Henry, the chief medical officer in, uh, in uh, Ontario, who, um, who you know, has been tremendously successful against someone like Trump, who argued, no, this is really about me and I have total authority over the virus and we, you just need to uh, do what I say and everything will be right. Right. That was, it was never going to work, um, and it didn't. Leaders also, and then second thing is they need to represent us and our goals. They need to treat groups as the solution, not the problem. And they need to treat group members respectfully, fairly, and as equal partners. So if you like, it's a rejection of the group think model, which suggests groups are the problem, and rather you know, recognizes that community groups, organizational groups, are the place where the, you get the traction to deal with problems as they arise. As this uh, newspaper said, it's heading says, it takes a village to beat a virus. And again, you don't have one rule for the people at the top and another rule for the people at the bottom. Instead, everybody understands that we are really in this together. That's critical. You realize shared identity in plans and policies. So leaders are more effective if they look to explain and persuade rather than coerce and punish or punish and if they advance a broad and inclusive in-group. So again, 
uh, what you see is that where people's first instinct has been to stamp down on people and to, and to you know, as it were, bring in the police to kind of uh, manage things or to take a very kind of aggressive authoritarian kind of uh, take on problems as they arise, that's generally not led to the best uh, outcomes. Um, uh, uh, it's actually getting people to buy into the collective vision and to be persuaded of the value of doing things is what's ultimately won the day. You then need to reinforce shared identity through ongoing action. Leaders are more effective if they focus on achieving and locking in outcomes that are valued by the group uh, they lead. So again, a big predictor of leaders' success has been their strategy in keeping infection rates low. That's, you know, that as a priority is, is, for, is what really probably matters most to people up till this point. And if you can deliver on those outcomes, broadly speaking, your stocks as a leader will be high. But if you don't, you're going to um, uh, have a problem. This is pretty early on, those figures there. And of course, it's that, if you like, that's driven uh, you know, the very uh, rigorous control, not just of the borders of states, but Australia's borders as a means of signaling that, if you like, concern for the group. And notwithstanding your views about the efficacy of that strategy or appropriateness of it, nevertheless, it's been very effective in securing support for uh, leaders and their leadership generally. And the third, the final point though is, and this is a point, really it's the first point, is that of course what it's going to help you deal with a crisis, whether it's an organizational crisis or a, or a, a you know, a, a, a biological crisis in the form of the pandemic, is if your group is kind of ready for action in, and is in a state of preparedness. So really good leadership was about locking in social identity before the pandemic. So one of the big problems the US had was that going into the pandemic, it was, it was characterized by high levels of social division. In Britain too, it didn't help that they just come out through the most uh, you know, divisive referendum in, in their history that did not put them in a position to have this collective resource they could uh, draw upon. So leaders will be more effective if they've done the groundwork to prepare groups materially and psychologically for a crisis. So again, now, to the extent that you know, countries like Denmark have done a good job doing that, then they're in a good place. But if you're told we don't really need to worry about vaccination because everything will be fine, it's not a race, that creates uh, kind of problems. So just to wrap it up, to understand the psychology of leadership and especially in a pandemic, we need to move beyond the individualistic models that have dominated understanding today. I think the pandemic has brought home the importance of leadership that's centered on we, not me. And indeed, there's really nice data emerging in the field that the most effective leaders actually have been women. And for whatever reason, seem to resonate more to this idea that leadership is about us than it's about uh, me. It's a very, if you like, the, the I model is a very masculine kind of model. More practically, we need to recognize that social identity is a key resource for organizations and societies that supports leadership and group functioning. And then we need to work with people to try to build and harness that resource in organizations and beyond. And I think there's plenty of evidence that's coming through now that's not only a basis for leadership and group functioning, but also for mental health and resilience. And I think that's gonna be an absolutely, we're at that phase of the pandemic, I think, where not the group functioning bit isn't as, as, as prominent as the mental health and resilience bit. And I think the new psychology of health now is gonna be every bit as important as the new psychology of leadership. Indeed, one of the meta lessons of COVID-19 is that leadership and health are closely entwined. We always knew that, we always had that data, but the pandemic, I think, has really brought that home with real force. That then requires us to fundamentally rethink and redesign leadership development. That's something that we have been doing at UQ in the psych department through the development of our leadership program 5R. In the course of the pandemic, we've, we've rolled that out to a range of organizations, but most notably the House of Commons in the UK and Fletcher Building with, a, with the help of uh, 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 Madison Linfield, uh, one of the MOP alumni, very successfully. I think what we've got to do is we've got to translate these ideas into the organizational space and, and, and the broader social and political space very fast because, and we're going to talk about this more in a minute, I think there's, there's evidence there is a tidal wave of things coming our way to do with a lack or a loss of identification in the workplace that is not only a, a potentially a basis for dysfunction, critically it's a basis for uh, disengagement. So leadership that is centered on the cultivation of social 
identity is absolutely critical. Encouragingly, through this research and other stuff that we're doing in this space, we know that if you work as in your leadership development and your leadership programs to cultivate social identity, you can build team, or shore up team identity and identification. You can get goal clarity, goal pursuit, and, and group-related performance. And you can also lock in health and well-being benefits. But critically, and again, I think you know, people talk about the pandemic as the great reset. I think the time has absolutely come for us to abandon those old traditional ways of thinking about leadership, the ways of doing it, the ways of developing it. And more generally, we need to new, new models which allow us to comprehensively reimagine and refashion, I think, the psychological contract between employees and their employers, between team members and their leaders from the ground up. And unless you do that, unless your organizations are interested in do that, I think you've got a very bleak time ahead. Thank you.